Hey guys, it's Brad Laurie, your Blockchain Brad, and today I'm truly honoured to speak with a fellow Aussie. His name is Alex Saunders and he also runs Nuggets News. Mate, it is truly an honour to be able to speak with you and catch up and talk about blockchain and crypto. I'm looking forward to it, Brad. We've been trying to collab for a while now. We've finally got the time to both do it. So let's get into some uh, topics. But I've also have never heard your full story. So I'm looking forward to hearing your background as well. Likewise, mate. And yeah, it's, it, I really mean it, Alex. It's really cool to be able to sit down and talk with a fellow Aussie. We need more Aussies out there representing blockchain and crypto. Um, and yeah, I also want to hear a bit more about your story, about the real deal behind what makes Alex tick. Um, and to, yeah, to answer you uh, really quickly, a lot of people may not know, I, um, I started this um, with an interest in education. Uh, I didn't know about the money side of crypto. I didn't know about the, um, you know, many people talk about things like allocations and they talk about things like you know, early access. Um, they talk about investment. I, I didn't come truly with that agenda. I entered crypto because I really genuinely believe in the value of reciprocal education and learning. Um, and I thought that was a really good way also to empower myself and others uh, by just offering my own, my own thoughts and, and most importantly learning. So I spent the first probably six months just doing that, really just listening to other people, trying to understand what, what they think about uh, blockchain, uh, trying to learn from CEOs. And then it just evolved from there. But um, I genuinely do have a love for learning about how this whole ecosystem is and how it's going to evolve. What about you, mate? Yeah, I think most people would probably agree that once you go down the rabbit hole, there's just so much to learn and it starts taking up a lot of your time. So for me personally, uh, my story starts back around the GFC when I got some shares uh, from my parents for a 21st birthday, which shows my age. And then the GFC <laughs> happened and I was trying to understand how someone that gets paid to manage money full time can like not see a crash coming. So that was super interesting to me. I started learning about the stock market and gold and how banks work and uh, became a bit of a gold and silver bug. And then in 2012, I read an article on Zero Hedge about this thing called Bitcoin and it just sort of clicked, you know, as it does, you find out about this digital payment system with no banks and I just kept wanting to learn uh, more and more about it. So uh, in 2017, the space really started to pick up. Because before that, we had a little private Facebook group called World News and we'd share stuff about what we thought was going to make Bitcoin go up throughout 2013, 14 and 15. Okay. I wasn't around then. I sort of entered at the beginnings, I guess, of you know, the, the next chapter in what you'd done after that. So it was cool to know how long you've been in this space for. Yeah, so in 2017, uh, the public really got aware of it and there's lots of Facebook groups, uh, you know, getting into crypto and I got invited to a few of those and so many people just saying, you know, how do you even buy Bitcoin? Because I think we forget how much, you know, progress was made in 2017. So I literally just did a video on an old phone that I had at the time and uploaded it to YouTube and it was really bad quality and I thought I looked so, you know, stupid looking down into a phone and <laughs> someone asked another question the next day and I thought oh, I'll do a video about that and it just sort of became this routine and uh, next thing you know we've made a video I think every day for like two and a half years now. It's amazing yeah. every day and also Alex you know you're well known in Australia for being perhaps the leading speaker for crypto and blockchain so I genuinely mean this mate congratulations for all that you have achieved because obviously it hasn't been always easy throughout this project to really sustain that interest motivation and just um, achievement uh, but you certainly have the respect of many people not just in Australia but globally um, are you glad you did it mate are you glad you made the switch into this sort of educational role yeah, thanks, Brad. I think sometimes you sell yourself a bit short. I think you've got 30 odd thousand followers on Twitter, so I'm a bit uh, jealous of your Twitter following there. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was a pharmacist. I still am a pharmacist by trade. I haven't worked for a couple of years now, but I was you know, pretty unhappy with the job I was at and I was so passionate about crypto. And you're one of the crazy people that was sort of you know, telling your friends about Bitcoin and this new thing called Ethereum and just no one was interested until it started going up in price, obviously. Mm -hmm. So when I quit my job, I finally got around to cutting back to part-time and casual. And the day that I quit was actually the day Bitcoin peaked at $20,000. So looking back, if you have... Wow oh, Bitcoin's going to go down for the next 18 months, I probably wouldn't have quit. But I guess you've got to take some risks that a few things happened to me that were, I guess you call it, you know, a sign that I wanted to chase my passion. So, yeah, it's been pretty tough work, as I'm sure you'd 
a test to throughout crypto winter to try and make videos, keep people interested. And um, yeah, I think we're coming out the other side of that now. Absolutely, mate. And, and also, I, I didn't explain, and I think it would be good, I guess, to let your, our listeners know and even just to have a chat about it ourselves is when I did start into um, learning about blockchain, many people may not know, but I started um, reaching out to different people that I thought really understood the space, perhaps didn't have a voice at all. And I found Twitter really useful. And you mentioned Twitter before. But what I, what I found really valuable is the steps beyond Twitter, um, being, being able to sort of engage at that level was really just an opening platform to some brilliant thinkers, brilliant minds in the space. And very quickly, we, we started to forge um, a, a group, a research group. And that coupled with my love for, for education was also researching different blockchains. And it just so happened, very much like you, I was so fascinated by all the different startups that were emerging, um, not knowing at the time, Alex, <laughs> that the narrative of the day was really about white papers or fake white papers or, you know, it was a real mix, a real melee of credibility and very unscrupulous startups as well. So I really emerged in that period of time when I got a chance to assess the veracity, the, the veritability, the, the authenticity of a team beyond the white paper. And that's where it sort of led me from. Um, it was very much a research centric interest that I had, but I also definitely invested at the time. And it was kind of fortuitous because it, it led me down the path of further um, investments, but also it really taught me to be much more considered, much more um, uh, conscious of the kinds of risks inherent in crypto, you know, in that, and we can talk about that today, but it certainly put me in a good position. And I, you know, everyone got wrecked in different ways. I certainly did in different ways, but I learned a lot and I'm really grateful for that experience because now at least I can reflect on that and hopefully use that experience to build on uh, a better future, you know, and how I manage my own, you know, digital assets. And also more importantly, how I, you know, take part in this ecosystem as well. Yeah. So how do you go about finding those projects to research, Brad? Because I know, I know how hard it is now to find good projects and to research. And some of the uh, projects I see sort of flash up on your channel. I'm just like, where does Brad <laughs> find these? And, you know, how do you research them? That's a good question. And not many people ask, but uh, there's a few different ways that um, I guess every researcher has their own approach and methodology. For me, it's um, multifaceted, quite literally. So one way um, might be that I'll go and scroll through, let's say, conferences. And I'll have a, because often conferences, um, they start to hint at different startups that are about to come. You know, they might be startups where the teams are attending, but they haven't really let people know they're still in stealth. So if you do a lot of global research on different conferences around, if you start to do some of that research, you can start to get a sense of, okay, you know, what are these projects? And you get a, a billboard or a name, and then you start to, from that name, follow a trail. So you can do it that way. Um, another way I found really useful as well is aligning yourself with great researchers. So um, VCs, for example, I've really worked hard not only to get to know CEOs, but to get to know the research arm of many of the VCs. And, you know, it might be just a very collegial, loose relationship, but just having that ability to network among your colleagues, just like in any industries, it's really powerful because you, sometimes you do want to be the dumbest person in that boardroom or in that context. And I really do try to learn and, uh, from the knowledge of other people. And even today, I was talking to a colleague about some projects that, you know, that they were talking about and interested in. So it's not just my own research. Um, yeah, and, and many, I mean, we could go on and on about how different ways. Um, another thing you can do is find out what other people are interested in. Um, for example, if you go on Twitter, here's a good tip. Um, and let's say you, you know, you're interested in a particular VC or a particular person scroll through the, who they follow, get to know what interests them, start to network that. Because once again, I, I think the real power this year is not just the technology. It's the technology coupled with the ability for that to have uptake through the network and the narrative of that own startup. So mm -hmm. the strength is in not just the, you know, the benefits of that tech or, or the, the best of that tech. Because if you look at Google, for example, it was the 21st search engine, it wasn't the first. And so really more than ever now, all those narratives are coming to play as really important in your own, I guess, DD in, in your own research process. That's interesting you say that because that's something that I haven't really done much is, you know, sift through conferences and the list, but I did go to DevCon 4 when it was in Sydney and I absolutely enjoyed it. And we found or found out a lot more about a little Aussie project that used to be called Haven and they rebranded to Synthetics. 
and mm -hmm. watching their presentation and I know Kay now is thinking, you know, this is amazing. This is in the DeFi space. This is going to be big and that's turned into an, an absolute gem, one of our best, you know, picks for this year. But um, it's so hard to get to conferences when you're in Australia and most of them are overseas, I guess. So that's so true, mate. And especially for the cost as well for us. I mean, unless you can get some sort of support or sponsorship, which I think is great if you can get some, Alex, because I heard about your attendance um, in Sydney at that ETH event and a lot of people were really supportive of you attending that. Um, you also lead a lot of those meetups really well. You do represent in that context and in live scenarios. I, I wouldn't be as good at that, I'll be honest. I don't think I'd be as confident to do it. So I think as an ambassador for kind of the Australian leg of crypto, you'd be great to attend those. And, and like you said, you, you do get insights into those top tier crypt, um, conferences of, of what those um, new and uh, new and emerging um, startups are planning on doing. I think one of the things to add in with conferences is the risk of, uh, you know, just expecting that all conferences are going to be the same and they're all going to have merit and they don't. Some are really just conferences for conferences sake. So it's also about trying to differentiate what is a top tier um, white paper and a team and what is not. And that's a tough call because everything tends to align. And if you do enough research, you'll start to see almost a grading system of value when it comes to VCs and exchanges, as you know. And yeah. so often we see, you know, there's an alignment between poor quality and poor outcomes in many instances. Yeah, I think one time that I really wanted to get over to the US and go to a few of them, that was when it just took off in 2017. And at that point, it was almost, you could feel that it wasn't going to be worth going. You could feel that it was going to be all ICOs. And, you know, there were so many YouTubers back then and everyone was just doing the same same stuff. So I think that the dust is starting to settle in some mm. ways. I actually had that exact experience. You know how I was talking about that research group I started with. But we ended up going over for consensus, I think, in the year you're talking about. And I'll never forget it because when we went in, to that sort of lobby area, it was overwhelming so much so I really did want to go back home to Australia pretty much that day because it, it, the conference wasn't about, um, you know, what technology, what teams, what are you building? It wasn't about that true philosophy that we sort of entered in the space to see technological innovation. It was literally, it was like, you know, those speed dating scenarios. It really was, except that this was all about how quickly can everyone, you know, find out about the next shill. How can everyone get to the next 10x because they were literally rushing from meeting to meeting yeah. in the lobby? Yeah, I guess it, it kind of has its good and bad, doesn't it? Like we, we kind of know it's a, it was a bubble and we've always thought that 99% of projects are, are going to fail. But at the same time, in the dot-com bubble, you need overinvestment and exuberance to get people to come to an industry and the good projects to succeed. So I think it's a kind of similar thing and there's regulation coming and the space is mm. changing. But I think a lot of people would have learnt their lesson and they wouldn't still be invest investing in ICOs uh, even if the regulation hadn't changed at all, I think. But I don't know, do you agree with that? I, I totally do. And honestly, mate, like when we first started, there was certainly a lot more questionable startups. I mean, I remember, I think you've even talked about this. I'm not sure what the numbers are back in those, those times in 2017, but it was substantial how many were emerging. And by day, it just seemed like there was this bottomless pit of startups. Mm -hmm. But the issue back then was many of them were very empty. They were very... Um, they were all built for profit and engineered really for that short chill. They weren't really anything more of, of, of true substance. But now, like you're alluding to, is that we're seeing a more reductionist approach and that less is more philosophy, um, quality over quantity. Yeah, and even a return to the old projects was something that I've been talking about. And you see, like recently, Decred's been getting a bit more hype on social media. Um, uh, you know, Red Fox Labs building on top of Komodo, mm. things like Augur and, um, you know, Gollum. So these projects that were actually set out to be decentralized and do things are kind of coming back into favor. Whereas how many ideas can you possibly do? People tried everything and everything and a lot of it didn't need a token or didn't need to be decentralized. So true. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the space can get, um, well, I don't know if it'll ever get saturated. I'm just not sure if that's the fair term, but it does feel like, we need to focus and hone in on the assets that are already existent, really exploring what already is there as those different layers that make up the eco, whether that be layer one, zero, two, as you know. And right now we have significant infrastructural capacity there for the taking, for the making of the next, you know, 
decade of, of blockchain innovation and, and applications. But m- much of that is clouded by, and we were definitely, I'm sure, going to talk about that, and that is um, the crypto casino aspect, the speculation aspect, the, 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 the sort of interplay between tech and what is this anomalous space that we do see called the crypto sphere or crypto space. I mean, it really is a valuable sort of discussion to have because even today, you still see a lot of um, pump and dumps. You still see a lot of short-term success. But like you're saying is that we are both proponents of that long game. We both really want to see this work. Yeah, definitely. My investing thesis has kind of been investing very small amounts in projects that I, that I like and, and, you know, sort of letting them go for three to five years. And if they're not, ticking off things on their roadmap, then sell them and, and move on. But you've got to be prepared that something's going to work and something's going to fail. But if you pick wisely, it's like venture capital investing. These mm. things do 10, 20, 100 fold returns. So you've got to be prepared to, to have some losers. And as long as you're doing your research and having more winners, and I believe you know most people should have a fair bit of Bitcoin and too many people are 100% altcoins. And then the cycle changes we're seeing at the moment, dominance is up and just when everyone throws the towel in and gives up, altcoins will probably have another run again. It's just such sentiment driven and speculation and trading is a huge part of the ecosystem, but that's probably going to change, as you say, towards fundamentals and business models going forward. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's great to know also that you are so transparent about your portfolio. Not a lot of people are, um, but clearly, and you're right from the go-get, you've always been a real proponent of BTC. And I am not, you know, as vocal about perhaps the inner workings of any specific coin, but I'm not by any means anti-BTC. You know, a lot of people will suggest because I talk about a lot of projects, I might be, but it's not that. It's just that already there, it has such a strong network and narrative um, and it has such a strong brand and, and it doesn't really need, you know, as much uh, of an educational platform like many of these others. And certainly, you know, there are... Mm, there are nuances, you know, associated with um, sort of the emotive aspect of this. There's a lot of people who are very emotively charged or emotionally charged when it comes to BTC. But yeah. I really wanted to ask you, underneath the narrative, underneath the network, Alex, what, what is it about BTC that really got your attention, that really, really made you want to put your money where your mouth is and just drop that in as the major part of your portfolio? Uh, well, Back in the day, it was a small amount of money for me because I, you know, I was just graduating uni, so I didn't buy Bitcoin back in 2012 and pump. You know, I didn't have thousands of dollars in my bank account. Put it that way. So right. it was a small investment uh, with my dad as well. He was sort of interested when I told him about it, and it was a payment network in a digital world where everything is digital and instant. You know, we can have these high definition definition chats and we had Facebook at the time and yet as someone that had lived in England for a little bit if I want to send money over there it costs a fortune to do that and get ripped off in fees so as soon as I just knew the basics about Bitcoin that you could send money to anyone in the world instantly and throughout the time it was you know basically free or or very low fee that was the first thing that sold me and then you kind of go down the rabbit hole and you learn about oh, the blockchain, this is how proof of work runs. This is why it can't get attacked. So I think now I view Bitcoin as one of the most computer system, uh, secure sub- computer systems in the world. Now that sort of, that gets thrown around with that terminology because the ASICs are good at doing the Bitcoin algorithm, but technically they're not good at doing much else. So you can't really say it's the most secure computer network in the world that gets thrown around on Twitter. But it I certainly do- does, yeah. I do think we're going to see other projects piggyback off that. So I think it's uh, Elastos has merged mining and Komodo are piggybacking off Bitcoin for security. So Bitcoin's value as just being that secure network for other things to uh, peg themselves to, I think is going to grow in the future. And now it's been seen as a store of value because of the digital scarcity. So the same arguments as gold that people like to compare as well. So hopefully it becomes a payment network for some countries. Maybe it's not for other countries that have good infrastructure like Australia. But I think Bitcoin is so many different things to different people, depending if you're in Argentina tonight or, you know, it just, that's what I think people forget about Bitcoin, that it's a global asset. Yeah. Right. And Alex, I'm so glad we're talking about this, mate, because you Uh, Again, being a proponent, you know a lot about the inner workings of Bitcoin. And right now, when I go and try and educate myself, I'll go to someone like Andreas Antonopoulos or I'll listen to different debates happening in the space. And and often what I've noticed is that there are camps inside the the, the wider picture of the, I guess, the BTC narratives. And in in like one of them you're saying is about payments, it's about settlement, it's about uh, even currency. 
But then there are others who, who argue that SOV is the fundamental digital, you know, purpose or the, digital, the, the purpose of the digital assets. So I wanted to ask you, what's your view, given that there are all of these sort of fractionalized and sort of broken camps, perhaps, in, in, within the wider picture and the wider frame of BTC? Yeah, so I guess it all comes back to that point about the white paper being a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And this is where the Bitcoin cash guys say that, you know, fees are too high. It's no longer that real peer-to-peer -peer um, cash system. But then you sort of got to ask, well, what is money and value? And does money need to have a store of value aspect before it can be used as a method of payment? So that's why there's all these different ideologies. But I guess I'm a firm believer that the Bitcoin developers are taking this path where it's got to be very slow and steady because there's $200 billion at stake now. And if they make one little mistake, then maybe that does irreparable damage to Bitcoin's brand name. Whereas Ethereum have had the Dow hack and other problems, but they're kind of going for that move fast and break things and experiment angle. So yeah, I hope that Bitcoin and the Lightning Network keeps improving. Um, mm -hmm. and privacy sort of aspects are going to come into it as well. But I, I kind of think that if Bitcoin didn't change anything at all and stay the same as it is, it still has a store of value and you can still use it for payments for large amounts across borders. So it still has lots of great things going for it, even if at the moment fees get a bit high for the people that want to send a dollar to someone else. For example. Right. And, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about, mate, because you said that one of the reasons you got into it was because of that transmittance, you know, that we can transfer value. And I agree with you having Aussies love to travel. So if we can make it easy while we're doing that, this, or to send money to our loved ones, you know, that's great. But right now in 2019, the many of the, we have this word in crypto called hodler, um, which many are familiar with. Do you think that that's still the primary use case for Bitcoin? And I, I really mean this because right now we still see the, the narrative of um, buying to hold then and eventually to sell some of their asset to capitalize, you know, for things or for fiat. Do you think that's still the primary use case for BTC? Oh, that's a great question. So I think if you zoom out and have a look at the macro environment, which is something that I love to talk about, what's going on with money printing and negative interest rates, and you couldn't even have predicted these things five or 10 years ago. So with all that happening, Bitcoin has even more of a use case. And a lot of people are viewing it as a speculative investment, and that's fine because it's volatile at the moment. But if this continues down this path, then what happens if we have the other recession and we go to deeply negative interest rates? But then what happens when we come out the other side of that and 10 years later, we have another downturn? Are they going to take, you know, are we going to go to negative 10%? Are they going to be having to print hundreds of trillions of dollars? So I think a lot of people, this is where a lot of people go wrong. They sell too early. So a lot of people aren't good at trading or handling money and the emotion that comes with it. So I'd probably never sell all of my Bitcoin ever because I think where it's going long term, you know, unless something changes and there's mm -hmm. a bug in the code and we have to admit that we were wrong, something like that. But yeah, I really think that people in more and more countries every day are realizing that, geez, I'm losing my purchasing power and inflation is higher and what's going to happen in the next recession. You know, my wages aren't growing. The money system's not working for me. There's so many reasons for people wanting to park their value for their kids or for long term in some sort of asset that's outside the banking system. Right. And, and let's say that continues. Let's say, you know, I mean, you've even hypothesized about the prospective value. Um, some talk about 100K, for example. I won't ask you to say a number, but the reality is that many people who are pro BTC want to see it really escalate in value. Now, in that case, it's almost a bit of a crypto conundrum because if you see, you know, traditional uh, patterns of currency development over history, they tend to graduate to a more stable mechanism. Do you yes. think that's almost paradoxical or antithetical to the, to the very narrative of people wanting it to continue to snowball in value? Yeah, it definitely is in the sort of short to medium term because a good currency shouldn't be too volatile, as you say. So I see decentralized stable coins like the Make a Die being really important, and that was one of the first projects uh, that we that we covered. But I think Bitcoin is going to this large market cap, so I think it is capturing market share of gold, of forex, you know, of of different currencies. So to get to those big market caps you know, they're in the trillions of dollars, then it's going to be a, a rocky ride. So we have these big run ups. And then all of a sudden, you've got some investors that have made a lot of money and traders and they sell. And then mm. it starts going down and people get emotional and scared and it goes down 80%. 
And then all of a sudden we start growing again with everything that's happening in this ecosystem. So I actually think it's just part and parcel of making our way to a really large market cap. And now that we have more uh, you know, products and even the ability for traders to short, it actually helps stabilize the market as they take profits. So maybe in the next cycle, I actually think that we could definitely get up towards 100,000 in the next sort of four year Bitcoin halving cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, 20 years from now, I do think we could get to a million dollars per Bitcoin. And along the way, maybe the next downturn is only 50% correction. And the one after that is only a 30% correction. And then you say, well, you know, the Aussie dollar has gone down 30% in the past couple of years. So all of a sudden Bitcoin is just as stable as a lot of world currencies. So right. that's the way I view it. It's really interesting because you're sort of in the camp of suggesting there's an amalgam of it being a commodity, it being a currency at some point, really evidencing that in perhaps in the future being more, more clear but also it being a utility, some argue for one or the other. So it's really fascinating to see how different academics or even how different speakers of Bitcoin really colour it uh, today. But I did want to ask you, when Andreas Antonopoulos, for example, and I'm sure you know of him, he, he talks about this concept of sound money. Mm -hmm. um, in that context, you know, given that today we still see that the narrative of investment and literally the word assets being thrown in um, as a means of storing it, um, valuing it as something that eventually you can sell to, again, engage in purchases of goods and services in some other way. Yes. Do you think that, you know, his argument is going to be paramount in the future, that it evolves into and fundamentally sound money above, you know, something that you store? Yeah, I think it is going to make governments and central banks more responsible because I know Bitcoin is volatile and people say, well, what if you bought the top? But if you look at it statistically, it's gone up for 98.7% of the time. And in certain countries, it's gone up 99 or 100%. It's actually at all-time highs, um, I think, if you're in you know, Venezuela, Zimbabwe or whatnot. Mm. So for those people, when Andreas talks about this, about maybe earning their wage in Bitcoin, and we saw New Zealand legalise it, you can get a bit of your wages paid in Australia already with a little company called Get Paid in Bitcoin. So if all, all the countries and governments go down this path of being fiscally irresponsible with printing money and whatnot, a lot of people are going to say, well, I'm going to get more and more of my wages in, in Bitcoin. And comparatively, that is going to hold its value better. Now, maybe you don't want to get 100% of your wages in Bitcoin because it does have another 70% downturn in future or you need it to pay for things week to week or even minute to minute it's too volatile so you still have maybe other currencies or even stable coins for payments along the way until bitcoin has really matured but i just think as bitcoin is this sort of layer zero of the the whole global what is value sort of question just as we used to have gold and then on top of that you can have cash and then on top of that we have visa and mastercard as a payment system so i think bitcoin could just be this ultimate settlement layer Maybe the US refuses to use it, but if everyone else is using it because their currencies are starting to be too volatile and we get hyperinflation in maybe half a dozen currencies in another year's time, then people are going to say, well, hold on, we've got this thing that's digital, it's programmed, we, we know it's inflation rate, let's use this. Right. And in that context, you know, you've, you've seen the emergence of stable coins as well. And often, you know, the, con the, the, the premise there is to try and enable more global trade and more transparent trade, because as you know, the blockchain is relatively transparent. But if we see the emergence of these stable coins, how does it render BTC in that context, Alex? You know, if we see, for example, in history, um, through, with every innovation, with every technological era, we've seen progress literally within the, that tech stack. So the first development isn't always the one that's adopted um, finally and then has that global adoption, that mass adoption. So when, it, when we move forward and we talk about this in the context of BTC, whether it gets the mass adoption as that settlement layer or, or as the global currency, um, do you see, are you concerned at all about the emergence of other players in that space? If we're talking about you and I being able to be paid in these currencies? Yeah, so definitely as a method of payment, there's competition at the moment with A, other coins that have like instant and fearless transactions. They're better than Bitcoin as a method of payment at the moment. Now, maybe if you want to send um, $100 million, maybe the security of the Bitcoin network is even better than you having an instant free transaction because you're, you know, that security is worth a dollar to you. So, you know, I think it's different things to different people, but definitely competition as a method of payment. 
But if you tie this back to, say, Libra that wants to come out with this ultimate basket stable coin. Right. If over time, if you had half a dozen people in a suburb earning their wages in Libra and earning in Bitcoin, over time, I think we're going to see that those people that earn Bitcoin earn more. They hold more value. They increase their wealth. So comparatively, people say, well, yes, this is more stable day to day for paying for things. But as a store of wealth and over the long term, I think Bitcoin absorbs more value. Right. And, and what do you say to, I was listening to one of the VCs in San Francisco speak about this, one of the members of the VC, of a prominent one. And I tweeted about this. One of them was saying last year that they felt that other, like you're saying, other um, transactional platforms, other, other uh, blockchain-based startups that are more designed for that um, currency-based system were doing better. You know, they made it very clear, but they said that nothing does better than BTC when it comes to storing, you know, an asset. Mm. Do, do you feel that some of these VCs are, are dichotomizing this narrative for their own pockets and for their own profit? Because I'll allude to one person, I won't say his name, but there's one very well-known speaker in the space who has 50% of his assets just in BBC and he tells everyone about it. You know, and when you're a frontline speaker, uh, obviously you're going to be advocating for you know, uh, the value of your own holdings. So do you think that some of them are incentivized simply because of their own portfolios? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't mind naming Pomp. He's a friend of mine as well. But yeah. um, they've definitely got an interest and that's a great example of when you follow someone on Twitter you've got to know what lens they're, they're viewing it from and what's their narrative they're pushing. So, yeah, definitely take anything that anyone says from any community with a grain of salt because it's frustrating for me, someone that loves Ethereum, to watch the Ethereum crowd bash Bitcoin sometimes. So, right. But, uh, yeah, everyone has their own little sort of favourites, I guess you'd say. But um, getting back to the question, yeah, there's a big incentive for those people at the moment that are building investment funds and... If you're viewing it as, hey, park 1% of your wealth in Bitcoin and it's a hedge against global uncertainty, it's the new digital gold, that's the story that's kind of been sold, then to a lot of people that, that is appealing with assets and property, you know, highly uh, inflated at the moment, many would argue, what, you know, it's like insurance, it's an option on your portfolio. So I think we forget how small an allocation people have to something like gold worldwide, sovereign funds and whatnot. It's just become this boring asset. And Bitcoin is this even tiny little slither of gold at the moment. So it only takes a really small fraction of people to park a tiny bit of money for these things to explode in value. Right. And then there's the complexity, complexity of the legalities and the terminological issues. In Australia, you know them very well. You teach this stuff. But uh, we talk about blockchain being fundamentally borderless but when it comes to the jurisdictional sort of pressures that legalities put on to this whole ecosystem do you think that's an issue in itself in how each country determines the validity of this technology yeah so let's take china for example or india china's banned bitcoin like eight times in the seven years or whatnot of being mm. in bitcoin and we've seen india do it recently and it's sad for a company like zeb pay in india that were doing a great job to have to move away but what it does is push it into the black markets or gray markets whatever we want to call them and it actually gives bitcoin a premium it's a little bit like the war on drugs you know you make something illegal people want it more because of their curious nature and because it can't come into the country and there's no industry around it you know the price of drugs in countries where they're illegal is far far higher than those countries where they're legal. So it's, that's kind of one of the arguments I see. And at the end of the day, governments can only regulate the on-ramps and off-ramps. So that's another reason why Andreas talks about earn your wage in Bitcoin. You know, A, it gives you more um, anonymity online. Mm -hmm. And B, you're not reliant on an exchange to buy and sell. And people say, well, you can't pay for anything in Bitcoin. There's half a dozen debit cards now, like 10X, that will let you pay for things uh, with Bitcoin and websites like Living Room or Satoshi. So... I think it's just becoming an, an option for people to use if governments are fiscally irresponsible. Right. And, mate, it was interesting, too, to hear you talk about Libra because that really changed the game when it comes to top-down sort of interest in crypto. That mm. was a narrative that went global simply because of the, the parties that were speaking about blockchain and what, what it can do for their own interest. And, and, and then there was a the narrative of uh, the corporate coin, you know, thrown into the mix. Andreas is not a fan as you would know, but many people are excited about the conversation being had from the top. So in that context, mate, corporations and government 
I mean, how do you see those two parties playing, you know, out in this very convoluted space? And, and what, what could they potentially do to reform and reshape the way in which we engage in crypto now? Yeah, I think that's... Uh, Libra is a highly controversial project in some countries, and that's why I don't think it's going to go ahead in the means that it gets full global traction because there's going to be so many people that say, no, we're not letting Facebook become the World Bank um, and have power over our citizens' value because if it's another out, you know, it's an outlet. If a country is struggling and the government has all their value going into Facebook, into a, a US-based corporation, they're just not going to allow that. So the other thing it got people talking about was the scale of centralized versus decentralized. Mm. So you'd probably argue that Bitcoin or Ethereum with 10,000 full nodes, it's pretty decentralized. You can't shut that down. And then we have the scale with things like EOS and NEO that they've got the trade off and for mm. better speed and whatnot. And now a lot of people bash them and say that's centralized. That's not that's decentralized because we still get to vote for the nodes. And, but at the end of the day, if Facebook come out and they have, 21 at the moment or they're trying to get 100 corporations that's not that different to the model that some of these crypto projects are doing except we didn't elect them they paid 10 million dollars to join this that corporation coin so to speak so it's really getting people thinking about maybe those different um, nuances that they didn't really um, consider previously right and also the fact that there is this dual mechanism this dual currency design i I, I suppose in that they have an investment coin potentially in their architecture and they also have the stable coin that is designed to really potentially uh, enfranchise more global trade and facebook are arguing that they are uh, separating their interests as facebook Mm -hmm. to libra uh, and obviously basing it on you know the backing of Calibra, but do you feel that's going to be sustained given that in history we've certainly seen the opposite and that interests have collided and and there's been, you know, self-serving interests for the corporations that start something like this um, eventually, you know, with clauses that we don't simply, you know, read when we sign up to things like Facebook. Yeah, so I watched both of the hearings in Congress and Senate, so nine hours worth and I actually find that stuff fascinating and they were, you know, putting Facebook through the ringer. So, you know, you're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart, Facebook, and with your track record and Google and Visa and MasterCard haven't just decided that everyone needs a cheaper, fairer payment system. So I definitely think that the regulators are going to push back really hard. And Facebook have said, oh, it's non for profit. And yet these people are paying $10 million to run a node and they've talked about the second coin, as you said, which sounds like an STO or equity split. So mm. that's why it could never be ultimately better than a true cryptocurrency because they are still going to have to collect the fee or make money somehow uh, and it has you know i did a whiteboard session with the the ticks versus the cross yeah, i saw that actually it was good and it, it just can't compete on all the things that make a blockchain and cryptocurrency great right and mate in the future we've seen certain parties in asia particularly I and mean, even in europe seem to they're starting to indicate interest in libra because yeah. obviously the us has reacted what are your sort of what's your prediction with regard to what will happen with Libra? Do you think it's still going to evolve regardless, given that it has a foundation in Switzerland? Yeah. So I think if it goes ahead, it is going to have a lot of users. There's people that are going to use this and maybe it's just to buy their movie tickets or it becomes a bit like the WeChat in China. So I, I think it would be you know arrogant to say Libra is never going to work because Facebook have 2 billion users and they're going to make a, easy to use product, which is something the crypto space hasn't done well so far for people. Mm -hmm. But I just think at the end of the day, it's going to get more people talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin when they see that Bitcoin going up in value in the next bull market. And they say, why doesn't Libra go up in value? And they just get that basic notion of a stable coin versus Bitcoin as a store of value. Just going to get people really start up understanding these concepts right and mate you know it's interesting because as aussies one of the words we probably don't like to use is influencer and we hear that word thrown around a lot but you know the reality is that many of the frontline speakers whether they be someone like pomp or someone like us um you know there's a degree of responsibility inherent in having that frontline position now in that context what do you what do you what's your sentiment with regard to influencers like what do you think when it comes to um the responsibilities are we fulfilling that role right now and are we doing a good job yeah that's a great question so i don't really like that that word either but uh influencers i guess in the global social media space 
have become way more prominent. So, you know, people with a lot of followers on Instagram or Facebook, they have a lot of power these days and advertisers pay them a lot of money. And we saw the same thing happen in the crypto space. So I know you and I have both sort of found it hard at times to survive with that because we've chosen not to do, you know, the ICO token promotion. So Mm. yeah, for us, we had to personally find other avenues like education and more recently working with, you know, the good reputable exchanges if they want to sponsor your podcast and they're not trying to sell your audience something. So yeah, I think there's ways where you can survive, but I guess, yeah, I've always tried to come at it at the same angle as you have uh, being very ethical, but people are wising up to it. I think now where a lot of people are still pushing IOs or ICOs at the end of the day, how many good projects can there possibly be? Mm. And, and there's going to come a time where, when the rubber hits the road, as we like to say, where people are going to say, well, hold on, all these projects were failing that got pumped. Um, and, right. Know. And I'm really glad we're bringing this up because obviously the intention is not to, you know, attack any specific person, but really raise the, the issue, raise the potential risks of this, this pattern we've seen emerge. And that is, you know, this, this opportunity, the opportunism that's really challenged the whole purpose of, of being an educator in the space. Now, you alluded to education being the premise. I feel the same. And it is true that it is really difficult to survive and make a living in crypto and can try and retain as much of your ethics and your morals as you can because it's tough you know, talk about stuff in this crypto environment where things are monetized. It's always the risk in doing it. But inherent in in all of this now, especially in the IEO phase, post ICO, we see a lot of these wrappings, discussions of BTC with very um, implicit and and, um, sort of nuanced messages of uh, certain altcoins, you know, uh, as the term goes, or uh, with other startups. But many of the parties who are speaking are really advocating for you know, consolidation into BTC or they might be paid in BTC for their representation of that coin. So there's a lot of problems, I think, going on that many people aren't willing to talk about and it doesn't require us to target anyone, but really just to raise the question of are you really paying attention to what's really going on? Yeah, and I mean, I've got friends in the space that do do the paid model and I don't really have a problem with that as long as they're disclosing and just because of project is paying someone to talk about it that doesn't mean that it might not end up being a hidden gem and being really successful down the road so yeah it's a fine line and i guess Mm. it's all about building a relationship with your audience and and trust which is what we've always tried to do because long term i think that's what trumps everything and um we've already seen that take place a little bit with the the washout of a lot of youtubers and ico reviews and that with crypto winter so i know right. you've got some strong thoughts on all that Brad. well you know mate I, I i tend to really agree with you you know sorry about the headphones but yeah i mean I, i'll just fix that so I, I tend to agree with you also mate with regard to you know the transparency you know at the end of the day if people are really upfront, if they're truly representing their their truth um as an educator and as someone in the space i think that's what we're what we're asking for or any any representative whether they be an influencer whether they be a speaker and as a vc or um, someone who is a research member of it it really doesn't matter the the most important thing is that people are really upfront because there's a lot of different layers you know to this whole process and it's taken a long time for us both to learn what it is to uh, really know crypto hundred percent. And I remember the story I tell is a coin called Aurora coin in 2014. Uh, that was one of the first altcoin cycles and it was going to be the official coin of Iceland. And I got FOMO and you know, lost money in, in that. And it, the, the cycle comes a- again. So it's not the first time it happened in 2017. And I think it's going to happen again. It will look different. It won't be the same as 2017, but Yeah, my advice has always been that I think 99% of projects are probably going to fail in the next five years and investing a small amount into the ones that you like so that if you have these losers, it it doesn't affect you. Because I I think the biggest problem we see is people with huge exposures to just these random altcoins. And even if they're not a scam, even if they mean well, maybe they can't get developers. Maybe they run out of funding. Maybe someone else does their idea better. So there's so many things that can go wrong. And I know personally, it's still it's hard not to fall in love with ideas and projects. Sometimes you forget that it's a, a startup in the tech world. Exactly, mate. I wanted to ask you as well. Given that even today, a lot of people talk about BTC as king. Um, there's a strong discussion this year about uh, equality 
you know, and the discussion using the Gini coefficient, trying to assess whether or not BTC fundamentally is a true representative of fairness, whatever that means, because it is so subjective. But when we talk about just in terms of economic prosperity globally, um, let's get real, real about the stakeholders in BTC. Um, mm. Do you feel that it's a fair or reasonable or even equitable representation um, for the kind of ideals, for the kind, kind of a white paper that it did purport to have? Um, if we use numbers, for example, like 2% um, of the stakeholders have you know, a, the, the, a, such a substantial amount of value in BTC. Yeah, so... I'm not a common economist, but here's the way that I, I tend to think about it. What we've seen in the current financial system is inequality getting worse, particularly since we had QE and the, the GFC. A lot of assets have gone up in price, the wealthy have benefited, and at the other end of the spectrum, the average guy on the street now needs to take out a huge loan to buy a car, go to school, and then try and get a, a mortgage in Melbourne or Sydney. So they're hurting a lot. So at that end of the spectrum, the inequality is getting worse. Now, in Bitcoin, we've got early adopters. You can see the top 100 addresses. You know, they're pretty wealthy guys. They're the whales. But a lot of them haven't moved coins and they haven't sold. And that shows to me, if they're not selling at 20,000, you know, they're here for the long term. And a lot of them have made a lot of money. And a lot of them have the cypherpunk sort of, you know, ethos that how much money is too much? If I've got a million dollars in a great house... I don't need to dump a hundred million on the market at the moment. You know, I'm, mm. I'm pretty set for the long term. So I think mm. as Bitcoin gets spent more and adopted more and used more, it sort of makes its way through the ecosystem. And as Andreas says, hopefully more people start to earn it as well. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of data to suggest and, and that's being reiterated by many of the different, uh, you know, whales even, but even the VCs who really push forward, I'm, I'm sure uh, Novogratz, for example, would, would argue this, or even Brian Armstrong, many of them are saying that the data suggests that there's an increasing distribution because as, you know, we move in time, um, many of these whales are starting to offload some of their holdings, you know, for, you know, obviously their own interests, whether they want to go and cash out into fiat or they want to buy goods and services, like you said, we can. Uh, the, yep. the, the thing is distribution is increasing. But I did want to ask you, though, in the sense of uh, global um, fairness and global equ equality, global distribution of wealth, when we're talking about that from a financial standpoint, do you think that we are risking rehashing and reinventing the, the age-old problem of inequality because of the fact that these people exist with such significant holdings, whether or not they be good actors or not. Yeah, I mean, we definitely run that risk. But if we pivot slightly, so let's talk about mining. So a lot of people say that's very centralised because of the, you know, the mining um, farms and whatnot. But the reality is a lot of people can join those pools from a different location in Australia and I join a Chinese pool. So I think mining is a great example of something that was dominated by Bitmain and now there's other manufacturers, there's competition and that's probably going to become more decentralised as the ASIC space gets more competitive. So maybe right. the average guy can actually hook up an, an ASIC with some friends and he's got renewable solar farm in Outback Australia and, you know, they're going to be able to mine. So I think that alone also helps disperse coins, particularly if we have, you know, renewable energy takes off in developing nations. Mm. Someone builds a solar farm in, in Africa and they, they hook it up to Bitcoin and mine it to help pay it off and bring money into the local community. The other side of that is, we're seeing this already in, in Asia and Australia, competition. So there's high wages in Australia for, say, an architect. Now, once we have good internet and we move to this online task economy, maybe there's an architect in, in Asia that's $10 an hour and they, they do just as good a job. So it's a bit like a water level. And now that we can pay people with cryptocurrencies, it's possible to pay that architect $100 to do you know, 10 hours work we don't have to pay a bank a hundred dollar international transfer fee. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And we've both done that as Aussies because it is so expensive considering we have so few options really when it comes to the major banks. Now, mate, when it comes to just obviously trading is a, a common fit, sort of scenario we see now is beyond just the speculation, we see rife daily trading. Do you think that is also aligned with, you know, what you signed up for? Because we see people trying to profiteer from very quick movement in the volatility of, that is inherent in all crypto. Uh, is, that, um, is that consolidating the potential of this whole system or is that a, a challenge to it? Yeah, I definitely don't think that's 
part of Satoshi's vision was people going 100x on, on Bitmax. But I mean, I, I do enjoy trading. Um, I, I think like the stock market, it's probably become way too prevalent with all the bots and algos. And I did a video on this recently as well. But mm. it's bringing people into the space. A lot of them are speculating. Maybe they come for the money and maybe a few of them do learn about the tech and the ethos and they they start the movement and they tell some friends. So yeah, I, I think volatility is something that burns a lot of beginners and how easy it is to hop on an exchange and trade 100x and they wish they hadn't. They wish they had have learned how to trade or not done it at all. So yeah, I don't think it's something that I'd say is healthy or that great for the space, but um, it's part of the game, I guess, part of the, the learning curve of getting into the world of crypto. Right, and mate, what do you think about the scenario that's playing out now. And quite sincerely, if you listen to you know, enough people who really educate us on Bitcoin, capitalism comes up as a topic. Because, and often it's a very pro-capitalistic scenario, many arguing for the, the fairness of the open, a free market. You know, it enables you know, a, potentially a, a globalized, you know, borderless scenario. But we've seen already those, those iterations happen in history pre-blockchain and pre-crypto. Um, do you think that capitalism is really overused as potentially an excuse for some of the capitalization on using crypto. And why I ask this is because let's use some examples. Let's say you're the white collar American or, or you know, the white collar Australian or really, really anyone in that developed region who's just had the, the benefits of having access to, first of all, the cryptographic knowledge that existed in 2019 or say through to 15, um, engaged in crypto because of that access. Um, and then from there started to play with it as an, as an investment instrument, as a means in which try, they were trying to increase their own financial position, as opposed to, let's say, you're someone in South America or someone in developing regions where you're literally trying to utilise that to just survive. Um, do you see what, where I'm getting at? Is that the, the paradox here is the intent, um, the, the purpose. Is there, at any point, are we getting to uh, a dichotomization of how people really need this to work yeah i think people in the investing world are trying to value what something will be worth at a given point down the road so maybe those people that are speculating that don't need it as much as the community in africa they're speculating on that community in africa really needing this and adopting this in the future so does pushing up in value help reduce the volatility that helps make it a better currency i you know i exactly. don't have but that's the question, Alex, I need from you, brother, because we need to know that our friends in Africa and South America can use Bitcoin for their ends, you know, to, to suit their needs. And is that going to happen if we keep driving the price of BTC up? I think it definitely can. So I definitely think that people will start thinking about things in terms of Satoshis and maybe stable coins, build that bridge in the meantime when there's too much volatility, as we already touched on. In terms of capitalism, I think the ICO for all the bad that came of it, being able to move value around the world. And we, we talked to startups in Australia and they said there's no appetite for investing in startups in Australia, let alone tech startups. So mm. the fact that people could have a good idea and, and raise money from anywhere around the globe and from the little guy, the little guy can put $100 into a startup with a good idea that he supports. I, I think they are revolutionary concepts allowing value to flow frictionlessly around the globe. Right. And, and obviously, there's a lot of um, support for the model that is proof of work, which underpins Bitcoin. But do you think also that narrative, given the mechanics of proof of work, because it's very mechanical operation, it's a very algorithmic design, as mm -hmm. you know, solving a puzzle, puzzle on the blockchain. But do you think that's appropriated or misappropriated in the context of proving work? Because when we talk about capitalism, often inherent in that is doing the work you know if you do the work you get the results you get the reward you get the you know, entrepreneurs benefit but the risk in appropriating that is perhaps to support the argument that is often very um, uh, very egocentric it's very self-serving you know it comes from that that premise of I I I rather than we 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 but when does the conversation of giving back, when does the conversation of supporting your fellow man in the context of all of this financial, uh, you know, development, all this prosperity, this financial and economic prosperity, when does that start to come into the conversation as well? Because right now, Alex, we see a lot of greed. 
Yeah, so there's certainly a lot of greed and people trying to get rich quick. I'd also say that the Bitcoin community have been the biggest supporters of a lot of libertarian movements, where whether it's Assange or um, MAPS. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the research they do on psychedelic drugs and there's huge Bitcoin donations go to them because no money would go to them from corporations or the pharmaceutical industry. So I think there's a lot of people that are wealthy with Bitcoin doing, doing good things. Um, getting back to proof of work, I think if you made it any easier, then Bitcoin would have already been attacked by now. You know, a right. bank or a government could could wipe it out. So it has to be that hard. And it, 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 again, it comes back to what is Bitcoin worth? How much would it cost you to buy however many 100,000 ASICs are around the globe you know, and build that infrastructure? It would probably cost more than Bitcoin's market cap at the moment. So that network itself, I see having a lot of value. Right. Well, clearly, you know, you have a lot to say when it comes to Bitcoin, mate. Um, you know, you've been in, in the game for a long time. It, looking back, is there anything that you would change, you know, if you started again? Or are you, you know, are you satisfied that, you know, this is just something you know, of a learning process? Oh, Brad, I've made that many mistakes and <laughs> hacks and all the stuff that happened on the wild ride. I do a lot of things differently, but I'm actually a believer that everything happens for a reason. So if I hadn't have you know, lost those Bitcoins in the early days, wouldn't have found Ethereum and never started Nuggets News. So yeah, I've quite enjoyed the ride. Um, I think people learn a lot about themselves and a lot about investing and the way the world works, which is, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but once they go down the rabbit hole and learn about Bitcoin and other cryptos. Absolutely, mate. And what about the future? You know, if we were going to use the, the impossible crystal ball and let people know what we're thinking, how would you paint, you know, the next few years of crypto, um, of blockchain innovation and really, you know, the way in which things are going? Uh, so I see the big issues being scaling. And at the moment, Bitcoin is trying to make itself as efficient as possible before increasing the block size because then it makes it harder to, to run a full node and have bandwidth in developing countries. So that's kind of the, the debate that's you know hotly discussed on social media. And we certainly think is. Much. Uh, privacy, I see. I made a video called the number one headwind for Bitcoin and Ethereum and all coins really is they're implementing privacy. So we see today Coinbase announced they're delisting Zcash. And I did see that, yeah. Yeah, we saw Japan um, crack down on privacy coins. So it's this whole battle about, you know, what is privacy and what are human rights? Um, should someone be able to give value to another person without that being tracked? So I really see that as a big discussion that could maybe cause a two-year crypto winter after we go to 100,000 in three years' time, you know, it's just, it's never going to be a smooth ride just up and to the right on the chart. And, mate, I really wanted to ask you this because you know I'm not a big fan of the term, but many people throw out the, the other term of altcoin because of Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on the maximalist agenda compared to everything else? And I really wanted to ask you this. What, is your, what are your thoughts on the word shitcoin since it was literally thrown out and used in Congress? Yeah, I mean, I'm not someone that uh, swears that much. So I guess when you hear that coming out of Congress members' house and, uh, mouth, it's a bit like, oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think it's just become the common terminology. And it's a fine line because I think there's a lot of crap and a lot of scams out there. So in some ways, people are right to call them shit coins. The terminology came from an alternate coin to Bitcoin and the, the name cryptocurrency. These were all currencies to begin with. Whereas now I really think people are moving to digital assets. I agree. Because some of these aren't trying to be currencies at all. So it's really and, and as Melton pointed out in her um, discussion at Congress, is that often crypto can also be regarded with regard uh, in, in the light of cryptographic, you know, representation, a cryptography yeah. behind that underpins many of these technologies. Yeah, and obviously I'm pretty favor look pretty favorably on Ethereum, and I think something like that maybe they get futures next and another investment product, and if they move to ETH 2.0 successfully, you know, at what point do you say this is a hundred billion dollar asset? We've got to stop referring it to it as an altcoin. Can you imagine if you know? you know, Facebook, and then we just called everything, you know, Altbook. That's Any why I wanted to ask you. Platform. Yeah. Exactly, because we see, um, even Ant Antonio uh, Andreas has argued that we see the programmability of Ethereum really emerge and distinguish itself from BTC in its fundamentals. You know that the smart contract really was, you know, through Solidity was really trying to uh, develop on from the BTC code. Now, in that context, surely there's, you know, 
there's financial instruments, whether they be uh, units of account, whether they be currencies, whatever they're deemed, whether they be regarded as digital assets and thus a commodity, such as Ethereum, um, and surely they have their own infrastructure, their own ecosystem, and should be validated and respected as such. Yeah, I think it's just the fact that the those people that would be doing the, the naming of these investment products, it's all, it's all brand new. It hasn't even happened yet. So the people that are left to do it are the tribes, crypto Twitter, the YouTubers, you know, so it's sort of everyone's running mm. blind and we don't know what's going to happen yet. Mm. It's possible that Ethereum fails and I own other platforms as well. It's possible that they fail. But yeah, at what point do you say there's thousands of developers working on thousands of projects on top of Ethereum it deserves a bit of respect. Andreas has written a book about it. I don't think we can just keep calling it an altcoin. Right. And mate, I wanted to talk to you also just about the way in which branding plays a significant role because we talked about influences. But the reason why is because even today, we still see a, a huge push for BTC branding. Um, what, what, if we wanted to quantify that as some sort of point of value, how important is consistent branding to crypto when perhaps there isn't overt correlations between the token um, and the growth of their own startup? So you mean for other projects and, and how they relate to the, the token with the name and the branding of the project? Well, even BTC, because a lot of people say because it's leaderless and so Satoshi you know, has taken you know, a significant step back and just observes, um, that, but if we look at it more in the macro level, it's more the, the participants in terms of the investors, you know, those who are really playing a, a significant part in the, the narrative of value. So say, for example, right now we see similarly scarce uh, tokens, uh, such as Quant Network, for example, or, you know, we could go on with many other examples, but many people start to really you know, support the brand that they are invested in, whether that be BTC or any startup beyond the team themselves. So how important does it become when these really emotive groups emerge, whether they be BTC or whether they be in these other startups? Because it seems like they can really change the outcome of the price. Yeah, so I, I definitely think that communities at the moment in speculation are driving the price of the smaller projects. But I like the analogy of Bitcoin as that honey badger that just gets stronger no matter what gets thrown at it. So you know, Bitcoin's had all these hard forks now, which is a free market saying that we think ours is better and look at them, they're performing terribly compared to, to Bitcoin. We've seen, you know, the China ban, India ban, mining ban. So all these things have happened and yet this coin's gone from having no value to worth $10,000 per, per Bitcoin. So every year this happens and it's now 10 years and people are actually saying that. We hear macro commentators saying, this network has survived for 10 years without being hacked and it just keeps producing a block every 10 minutes. It's doing its thing. So I just don't think that you can ever replicate that first mover and that brand name and that network effects that come with Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. So you're a real proponent of the narrative of BTC being king. Yeah. In terms of other things being better as a method of payment, we've discussed that today. But you just can't, we can't make Bradcoin and Nuggetcoin and tell people that it, it has value because you can send it from A to B mm. and, and, it's, and it's faster or it's private. The value comes from the network effects and everyone else believing. And the other 10,000 coins just don't have the store of value, the 10 year track record, the belief. Mm, I think that's a big point that that point of belief, you know, the, the fact that there is that, you know, history of support and there's been significant number of bubbles that and from that whenever a bubble happens typically in economics that can that can crash a startup very fast but this has been a consistent re-emergence from several different iterations we've seen in history so it, it certainly does suggest that there's a strong grassroots support for whatever you know we we deem this to be but <laughs> I just okay. jump in quickly, Brad, and say, look at Litecoin. It's been the silver to Bitcoin's gold that's tested the new implementations like Segwit. It's got Lightning Network. If Bitcoin gets really busy again, people are going to use Litecoin again. Look at Dogecoin. It's got a market cap of $350 million, and it's a joke project, but it's got a strong community, a lot of OGs in there. It's stood mm. the test of time now. So they're the sort of things which sometimes people look for a flashy website and that, and that doesn't mean anything. Right. And does it surprise you also, Alex, that we genuinely see, even in the top, let's say top 20, there are literally joke projects in there, you know, technologically in a few years' time, we're going to see that um, mm. empirically shown. But do you think that 
it's got to the point in 2019 where many of the participants in this, what is relatively small space, just don't care that they're more focused on the crypto casino and accept the, the, the sort of empty, uh, um, unproven state of many of these tokens. Yep, and go look at coin market cap five years ago. As I said, Aurora Coin was number three at one stage, and everyone thought it was going to be great. And these things come and go, and it's going to continue to happen again. I don't want to pick on something like Tron, but you know, look at what happened recently with Justin having to come out and apologise. Mm. Now, are Chinese businesses and people are going to look at that and go like, "Oh, I want to build on that infrastructure rather than you know Ethereum or EOS or something else?" And how you can't just keep going on for years and years buying a few partnerships here and there, hyping up a project. Eventually, people are sitting on coins that are going to end up being worthless if you're not using them in the real world. Right, and I think that's the final thing I wanted to talk to you about because this is going to be perhaps the most important part post-discussion and in the next decade, and that is proof of utility, proof of genuine value when it comes to empirical evidence. Um, enterprise sectors, governments, or, or whatever sector it is, they need to show that they have an interest and that they can utilise this to really, be, uh, to really build the economic prosperity of their own entity in the mainstream. So what is there right now, Alex, that's proof that any of these can work, including, you know, BTC beyond the SOV, any of them at all, where's the real proof that we can know that this whole blockchain-centric uh, uh, philosophy is going to translate into proof? Yeah, so I don't think anyone could argue that people aren't using Bitcoin every day around the world as a store of value or a payment system. Then we go down and we look at Ethereum. The ICO and the ability to raise money, yes, it turned into a bubble, but that was a revolutionary concept and programmable um, you know, smart contracts. Uh, we now see DeFi really exploding. You can take out a loan directly from your ledger hardware wallet. You can earn interest. I think insurance is one of the next big waves a lot of people are working on on Ethereum. So you, you can't argue that people aren't using some of these in the real world. But yeah, as you go down that list, it pretty quickly starts to become 100% about speculation and people not using any tokens in the real world. Right. So obviously, you know, your advice to many, given that it is relatively speculative still, would be what? You know, if they're engaging for the first time now listening to us, what would your message be? Yeah, so I had one of these moments where you get a realisation of the things you've been discussing and never put your finger on it, where I'm setting up some of my parents' friends now that are that different older demographic and they want to park 10,000, 100,000 of their accumulated wealth in Bitcoin. And they, they're just getting set up with Bitcoin and learning how to use a hardware wallet. They're not, I'm not encouraging them to go invest in altcoins or look down the list. And that's why we're seeing dominance rise at the mm -hmm. moment. And then my advice is if you learn about Ethereum or if you learn about an individual project, maybe they're more familiar with the industry basic attention token, Kyber, you know, maybe they like some of these concepts and they can see it working in their business model. Maybe invest half a percent of your crypto exposure into one of those projects because at the moment that can turn into a larger percentage if you invest wisely, but you have to acknowledge that it's pretty speculative at the moment. Absolutely. And Alex, it's really interesting because if you're letting people know who don't know anything about crypto, you give them that very macro analysis and you give them the, the, I guess what's easy, you know, for them to start to whatever's most palatable for them to start to understand that the, the the inner workings, I suppose, later. But then in someone in our position, given, again, that you know a lot about the crypto con convolution, the collusion that's going on, all the different uh, sort of parties that can really thwart the outcomes of uh, a startup itself, do you ever worry that sometimes there's been back-end engineering to really shape the beginnings of a startup because of the pump and dump scenarios that we see play out sometimes? Yeah, I think it's rife in the, the raising at the moment and the altcoins and that's why it's been very off-putting and to tell people to tread carefully and I don't really cover many of those projects on the channel now because I just, I, like I said, I just don't see that many good ideas. I think the market's pretty saturated. A lot of the time, some of the other projects are already working on similar things or Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin will absorb good features if other projects do something well and it becomes tried and tested so yeah i think a lot of people have learned this already through one cycle they wish they hadn't have invested so much in things they didn't understand
Absolutely. Well, mate, I knew I would learn a lot from you having a chat with you. It's been great just to catch up with someone that I wanted to become friends with as well. You are truly a respected speaker in Australia for uh, crypto, digital assets, for blockchain. And obviously, you're well known and respected right through the community that is the crypto sphere. Um, and I wish you all, 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 always the very best because, you know, you really do have a genuine, genuine interest in education and you certainly are putting skin in the game. You know, you're literally there showing that you're putting your money where, it, where your mouth is and you're participating wholly in this. So kudos to you, mate, for everything that you do. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Brad. And I know you really enjoy focusing on the tech and that as well. So I think people are going to be drawn to those fundamentals and, and the tech and the, the good guys win over the long term. So, um, yeah, keep up the great work as well. Thanks, mate. And um, hopefully we can catch up again and just do chapter two, perhaps, and really explore what comes of blockchain, what comes of new startups, and certainly you know, what comes of some of these startups beyond the narrative of BTC so that we can see more than just an SOV or more than just potentially a global, you know, set settlement system. And we start to see integration in enterprise really showcase what blockchain can do. Definitely. I look forward to seeing where we are in the future and we'll have to do a recap. For sure. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.